Hi guys, welcome back. Now this is a little more efficient than what we did with the burning chip. This is what we call a calorimeter. Now, this is a very low grade calorimeter, but it works nonetheless for what we want to do. The way that it works is you have something that's very insulated, like a styrofoam cup. Inside that styrofoam cup, I have some water. And that water was at normal temperature. And you saw that I was, I was heating a piece of metal, a piece of unknown metal. Uh, we're, we're wondering what that metal is. We're going to try to find out the specific heat of that metal and identify the metal based on its specific heat. So, the, the long and short of it is, you heat the metal to a point where you know what the temperature is. In this case, it was 100 degrees, and the water had an initial temp of 18.5 degrees inside the cup. I know the mass of the metal. I took the mass. I took the mass of the water in the cup. And then, once I got the piece of metal to 100 degrees, I took it out of the boiling water and stuck it immediately into the water inside the cup. And then after that, the temperature changes, doesn't it? The temperature of the water inside the cup begins to go up. The temperature of the metal inside the cup begins to go down. And the thing about that is, we can use this equation that we used in the last video to determine the heat. In this case, Q sub M is the heat of the metal the mass of the metal, the specific heat of the metal, and the change in temperature of the metal. We can also use this equation to describe the heat involved with the water. The heat of the water is equal to the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the change in temperature of the water. Well, guess what? These two, in this case, are the same because the heat that left the metal was absorbed by the water. It's the same amount of heat. It's just the direction in which the heat was flowing, from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And that's what energy does. Energy always flows from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So because of that, we can use this math to determine what the specific heat is of this unknown metal. So let's do that. Here we go. So I've set these two equations equal to each other. The equation for the heat of the metal and the equation for the heat of the water. And I've simply filled in the values that I know. The mass of the metal was 16.82 grams. The change in temperature was 79.7 .7 degrees Celsius. The mass of the water is 156.32 grams. The specific heat of water we know, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And the change in temperature of the water was 1.8 degrees Celsius. So now let's solve for the specific heat of the metal. All right, one thing that's important to mention also is we've got to think about direction of this heat flow because the metal is losing heat. It's exotherming, right? It's losing heat. The metal is giving up heat. So we're going to put a minus sign next to the equation for the metal. However, the water is absorbing heat. That's a positive. Sort of like, sort of like money. If I have to give away money, that's negative, isn't it? But if I get money, that's a positive. We can do the same thing with heat here. Now, what happens, though, in our calculations is that we have the negative here, but since we have a loss in temperature or a decrease in temperature, we have a negative here as well. So because of that, we're able to have the positive number here, in case you're wondering. So here is the product of these two numbers multiplied by my specific heat, which I have to find, and that's equal to these three things multiplied together. Notice one other thing, and that is that I've crossed out, I've canceled the units. We'll be left with joules over here. We'll be left with grams and degrees Celsius here. Even though I've used all of these 
decimal places. No one thing. We're going to be limited in our final answer by this guy because there's only two significant figures there. So this multiplied by my specific heat equals this. So when I divide this by this, I get an answer of 0.88 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, assignment time. I want you to see if you can find what metal I was working with. You could look up specific heats of various metals and see if you can find one that comes the closest to this number right here. And when you do, let's also do a percent error. You might recall I called this a calorimeter. You can maybe hear the word calorie in that, can't you? Units of heat. This calorimeter helps us to measure heat transfer. The transfer of heat from one item to another. In this case, the heat transfer from the metal to the water inside. So just about every chemical reaction or phase change involves heat transfer. So because of that, thermochemistry is the study of those heat changes, the transfer of heat that occurs in a chemical reaction or a phase change. So in thermochemistry, we usually study a system, something that we are wanting to know more about with regard to the heat either coming from the system or going into the system. In our case, with our little experiment, the system was this piece of metal, this unknown metal. So the system is the unknown metal. The surroundings would be the water, the cup, everything else, the building, everything else around it. All of that constitutes the surroundings. Well, when you combine the system and the surroundings, you get, yeah, the universe. One other thing that's important to note about our experiment, and that is this. It was done at constant pressure. We didn't increase the pressure or decrease the pressure while this experiment was going on. So the heat involved in the transfer process, that was at constant pressure. We have a special name for heat content of a system when it's at constant pressure. It's called enthalpy. And the designation is a capital H for enthalpy. Now, it can be difficult for us to determine the enthalpy of a substance. What is your heat content? It's hard to do. But we can determine changes in enthalpy. And this is the way we do a lot of our measurements. Changes in enthalpy can come, say, from reactions, where we measure the heat content at the final portion of the reaction as opposed to the heat content initially. So we might say the heat of the reaction is equal to the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. The enthalpy of the reaction. Let's give you an example. Here's the reaction of iron and oxygen to give us iron oxide it actually reduces a great deal of heat in the process. Notice this scale where enthalpy increases as you go up. Here are the reactants, iron and oxygen. Notice where they are on the enthalpy scale. Then notice where the product is. In the process, we've gone from here to here. 1,625 kilojoules worth of energy, of heat energy. So we would say that 1,625 kilojoules of heat energy is released in this process. Therefore, this reaction is exothermic, heat releasing. Now, an easy way to determine if a reaction is exothermic is to look at the enthalpy of the reaction. If the enthalpy is less than zero, in other words, if it's negative, it's exothermic. You could think of it as that the heat is actually a product of the reaction. Heat is given off. On the other hand, we can have reactions that do just the opposite. When we take ammonium nitrate and put it in water, it requires energy for it to dissociate into ammonium ion and nitrate ion. So here's our reactant, ammonium nitrate, here on our enthalpy scale. These are the products, ammonium ion and nitrate ion. Notice that there's an increase in energy overall, 27 kilojoules worth. Whenever you have an enthalpy change that's greater than zero, that is an endothermic process. That is to say a positive heat content at the end of the reaction means it required energy. Energy was one of 
the reactants in this case. I've rewritten these two equations to show you one more thing. The first one, where energy is a product, we called that exothermic, right? Notice I wrote that in red. This reaction actually gives off heat. It feels warm. In fact, this reaction is incorporated into hot packs. On the other hand, this reaction requires energy. Energy must be one of the reactants. Because of that, this reaction feels cold. And guess what? This is the reaction that they use in cold packs. So that's it for today. We've learned about how we can find the specific heat using calorimetry. We also talked about enthalpy, the heat content in a reaction, and how we can decide whether that reaction is exothermic or endothermic based on the enthalpy. If the enthalpy is negative from the reaction, that's exothermic. And if the enthalpy is positive from the reaction, that's endothermic. We also learned about thermochemistry and how you have the system, the surrounding, the universe, and the heat that flows from one place to the next. I hope it's been informative for you today, and if I can do anything for you, please let me know. I hope to see you guys really soon. Until then, God bless. Thank you.